So uh, just for fun, let me throw out a, um, a problem I heard recently that will is not completely unrelated to our upcoming material on random walks. So a um, 100 people are getting on an airplane that has exactly 100 seats. Everybody has an assigned seat. The first person sits in seat one. The second person is assigned to seat two and so on. You unfortunately are the last person to get on the plane, person 100. And uh, the person assigned to seat N really likes seat N. So there's no problem with conflicts between seats, except that the first person boarding the plane is kind of a free spirit. And they get on the plane and they see all the empty seats and they just sit wherever they want. So they choose a seat at random from among the first hundred. And then the more well-behaved people get on. And if they find their seat is taken, they just take another seat at random among the seats that are still free. And the question is, uh, what is the probability that you get to sit in your own seat? So I just thought that I'll throw that out as something we might discuss a little bit later while uh, just to pass the time doing the one minute while people are arriving. Um, okay, any questions on the problem? Okay, so let me remind you again, it's always great if you can uh, turn your uh, video on if you're willing to share. And, um, and we will, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start today by doing a, a neat calculation with extremal length just to finish that topic and then we're going to start talking about random blocks. So uh, this is um, the last extremal length problem I want to do, and it illustrates um, it illustrates how useful uh, metrics are. So here is the problem. Uh, let A be the annulus of obtained by taking the disk of radius R and then deleting the interval from minus one to one. Uh, where r is greater than 1. And uh, the problem is to estimate the modulus of a. And in fact, let's draw a picture here. So we have the interval from minus 1 to 1. And then we have the circle of radius r. And uh, the region in between these two is A. So, th so this is an annulus, but the, there's no interior to the inner component of the annulus. It's been squeezed down to a slit. And, and so the problem is to estimate the modulus. Now, one thing you might do is draw the circle of radius 1. And then you observe that A contains A of R, which is our standard annulus. Uh, one is less than the absolute value of Z is less than R. Um, and so um, remember that we have this basic uh, monotonicity that if one annulus contains another, then its modulus is at least as big as the modulus of the annulus it contains. So this implies mod A is greater than or equal to mod R, A of R, which is uh, mod R over 2 pi. Uh, the problem is to obtain an upper bound on mod A. And, uh, and the answer is, in fact, mod a is also bounded above by mod a of r, mod a of r, plus some constant. So in fact, the modulus is uh, basically log r. And you even know what the constant factor is in front of the log r. It's log r over 2 pi plus a constant. And that's pretty good especially when R is large, to have such a sharp estimate of the modulus. 
Now the question is, how do we obtain an upper bound on the modulus? So if we could show that A was contained in some annulus B that we understood, we would be happy. But there's the problem is there's no inside <laughs> to this interval. So you can't find another standard round annulus that contains A. So how do we, how do, we do this estimate? Um, so what we'll observe is for the proof or the solution to the problem, we observe that the modulus of A uh, inverse is equal to the extremal length of gamma theta, where this is the curves that go around the annulus. And, um, and this, luckily, is bounded below by the extremal length of gamma theta in any metric that we choose. So if we choose a specific metric where we can bound this extremal weight from below, it will give us an upper bound on mod A inverse. And now here's the metric I'm going to choose. So this is a typical example of a somewhat more sophisticated use of metrics than we've seen already. So I'm going to, there's going to be on the region from two out to R, I'm going to make this annulus look like the standard Euclidean annulus. So the height will go from log r to log two. And then inside this region, I'm going to use the ordinary Euclidean metric. So it's going to suddenly change its geometry when you get to the inside uh, of, of this region. And, um, and then we'll put those two together and see if they give a useful bound. So I let rho equal dz times 10 for reasons you'll see for the absolute value of z less than two. And otherwise I let rho equal dz over z. Uh, so for the absolute value of z greater than or equal to two. This is a metric on A. Okay, now what's the, what's the area of uh, A in this metric? That's easy in uh, this metric row. So we have, we can compute it exactly. We don't actually need it exactly, but from here to here, this is a cylinder of height of circumference two pi and height log r over two. So that's the area of this part between the red line and the outer radius. And then on the inside, we just have a Euclidean disk of radius two. So pi r squared is four pi, but we multiply by 10. So it's um, uh, 400 pi. <laughs> because we multiply the length by 10, so the area goes up by 100. OK, but in any case, you, you know, log r over 2, that's just log r2. So a good way to think of this is it's 2 pi log r plus a constant. And we're going to be interested in, in the value, the case where r is large. So we're, we're, our aim is to prove this. So we don't care so much about an additive constant. OK, now the interesting thing is, what can we say about, suppose we take gamma in um, gamma theta of A, a loop that goes around the annulus, what can we say about the length of gamma in the row metric? Let's call this L. What can we say about this? So I'm going to break it into three cases. So first, suppose gamma meets the circle absolute value is equals two. See, if it's outside here, I'm pretty happy I can use this metric, uh, this metric. And if it's inside here, I can use the Euclidean metric. What if it goes in the transition between the two? Well, there's two possibilities. So one is it meets absolute value z equals two, and it meets the inner circle absolute value z equals one. And this is the key trick when you're doing examples like this where you have two metrics. 
So what we know about this path, let me get a different color here. I don't know if this will really look different. It's supposed to be orange. What we know about this path is it winds around the annulus. But for this estimate, I'm just going to use the fact that it crosses from one circle to the other. So if it touches both circles, it has to be at least as long as a radial line that goes from this circle to this circle. And that radial line has length one in the Euclidean metric, so it has length 10 in this metric row. So in this case, L is greater than or equal to 10. Okay, the second possibility is that gamma meets Z uh, equals two, uh, but does not meet as equals one. So in that case, it's some sort of a loop that might, it, it doesn't meet the inside anymore. So it might go like, like this, for example. It has to go around the center of the circle. And what we notice is that this metric, dz times 10, is certainly bigger than this metric. So the length in the row metric of, of something that goes around this circle is greater than or equal to its length in this metric the cylindrical metric, and in that metric, any loop that goes around the unit circle has length at least two pi. It's, it's just its angular length. So in this case, the length is uh, greater than or equal to two pi. Um, now, um, the third case is that gamma does not meet equals two. Now, actually, this is really two cases. There's the case where gamma stays outside of the circle of radius two, but then again, its length is bounded below by two pi. Um, so the interesting thing is when it doesn't meet uh, z equals two, um, but it does meet, um, and, and, it, and it lies inside this. And it's and is contained in the region absolute values less than or equal to two. So that's our third case, and that's a loop which goes something like this. So all we know about this loop is that it has to enclose the interval from minus one to one. But that certainly means its Euclidean length is at least four, because the length of this segment is two. And we're in the region where the metric is the Euclidean metric times 10. So here, in fact, the length is greater than or equal to 40. Okay, so the main point is that we have lower bounds on the length in all three regions, in all, all three cases. And in fact, the worst lower bound is this one here, 2 pi. And I wanted this to be the worst lower bound because I'm trying to get the same constant log r over 2 pi that I got here. So in any case, for all of these cases, the length is at least 2 pi. So what can we say about the extremal length of gamma theta in this metric? Well, it's greater than or equal to L squared over A where L squared is the shortest length of a metric in this path family, and L is at least two pi. So this is greater than or equal to two pi squared over the area. And we saw the area was two pi log R plus a constant. It's bounded by that in any case, bounded below by that. And, um, and so the two pi's cancel. We can absorb the two pi into the constant, and then as long as r is reasonably large, we can put take the constant outside of this and get that it's greater than or equal to two pi over log r. 
um, let's say minus a constant. Um, but in any case, to uh, we we now have actually I don't even need to do that. Let me not do that. So we have this lower bound of this form, but that's a lower bound for the inverse of the modulus. And so the modulus itself is bounded by the reciprocal of this quantity that moves the log r up to the top, it moves the two pi to the bottom, and out comes an additional constant. So that's this, that's this proof. Okay, so that's an example of how one can bound the modulus in the case where one of the components, complementary components of the annulus has no interior. So you can't fit a ball inside it. You can still get good bounds, and the bound is just about what you would expect if this were a round ball. That is changing this interval to a round ball barely changes the shape of the animals. Okay, so let me just mention there's another way to do this proof. But the main point, and this is, should help your intuition, is that it almost didn't matter what this thing was, whether it was round or whether it was an interval or it was a fractal curve, what mattered was its diameter. And the diameter is what keeps the loops going around it from getting too short. And then this argument gives us almost sharp estimate on the modules. Um, so let me just mention there's another approach to this calculation. Which is um, that we know that somehow slits and round balls are very closely related to each other. Why is that? Well, we know that the map one half z plus one over z has the beautiful property that it sends the uh, unit circle to the interval from minus one to one. And the critical points of this map are the two endpoints of the interval. So the second approach to this proof would be to call this mapping F and consider F inverse of B. And F inverse of B is now gonna have the beautiful property that this slit has been opened up to a circle. Is there gonna be a price to pay, but it's a pretty small price. The pre-image of the outer boundary is now no longer going to be a circle. It's going to be a slightly wobbly curve. But what can we say about this curve? Well, this mapping, when z is large, f is approximately equal to one half z. So this outer curve is approximately a circle of radius r over two. And in fact, it lies within a unit neighborhood of that circle. And so that allows you to show that the, and of course the modulus of, uh, sorry, this should have been F inverse of A. Let's call this B. Of course, the modulus of B and A are the same, but now B has the property that it contains the standard annulus of radius, say R over two minus one, and it's contained in the standard annulus of radius R over two plus one. So that's another way to approach the calculation of the modulus of a disk with a slit. Finally, I should say it's, it's, uh, there's a nice fact, which is that um, the hyperbolic length, the hyperbolic distance between two points in the unit disk turns out to be a simple function, well, not so simple, but a computable function of the family of paths in the unit disk that separate the two points A and B from the boundary of the disk. And so indeed, when you have two points in a disk, you have a natural conformal invariant, which is the modulus of the curves that go around those two points. And that modulus turns out to be finite and it carries the same information as the hyperbolic length. So that's another way of thinking about the invariant of the hyperbolic metric. Okay, so this concludes our long introduction to conformally invariant 
analysis. So any, any thoughts or questions before we turn on towards the probabilistic approach to, um, to uh, these kinds of issues? So does that remark at the end mean that the same bound applies for any, any um, moving any interval of, of the same length, hyperbolic length? Uh, yes. It does, of course, because they're all the same up to automorphisms of the disk. Yeah. Other other points, questions? Okay, so now I'm gonna shift gears in a big way and um, and start talking about random walks. on the integral lattice in d-dimensional space, especially the case d equals two. Um, so let me tell you what our, our goal here is. Um, there's gonna be a couple of goals. One is we're gonna try to understand harmonic functions better. So we're going to relate random walks to harmonic functions. But these will not be harmonic functions on RD, at least not initially. They'll be harmonic functions on this grid. So these will actually be what are called discrete harmonic functions or harmonic functions on the integer lattice. Um, and then, our second goal will be to show that discrete harmonic functions tend to smooth ones as the mesh of our lattice goes to zero. In other words, we're going to approximate R to the D, or really R2, by a small number times d to the d. And show that the dis discretized version of harmonic functions converges to the conformal notion or the analytic notion of harmonic functions. And what's going to be, um, what's, and there's something very striking here. In fact, we're going to concentrate on the case two. And so in the end, we'll get harmonic functions on C. Now here's what's striking. The harmonic functions on Z2 have very few obvious symmetries. You can take, because the Z2 lattice has very few symmetries, you can take it and rotate it by 90 degrees, you can reflect it through a line or a diagonal, but not very much else. I guess you can translate it, that's useful. Um, but regions in the complex plane have an enormous number of conformal symmetries. And so what we're going to see is that this object here, which is called the continuum limit of these discrete processes that are taking place on a grid, acquires conformal symmetry. And that's an amazing thing that suddenly in the limit, the, the, the lattice disappears. It doesn't matter what angle we put the lattice down on the plane. Um, and it becomes invariant under this very rich set of symmetries, namely all Riemann mappings. And that's a fundamental theme in statistical mechanics, conformal field theory, et cetera, that there's a lot of uh, discussions, mathematical constructions, and so on, that proceed initially on a grid or dis discretized space, and then should have, uh, have some sort of limit, and the limit should ha have more symmetries than the original thing. And that's the discussion of what happens to the harmonic functions as we make the mesh goes to zero. 
Now there's another question we could ask, which is what happens to the random walks as the mesh goes to zero? And we'll see that the continuum limit of random walks can be defined, and this is what's called Brownian motion. And this will lead to probabilistic, probabilistic methods and interpretations of conformal invariants. Okay, so this is really, really the heart of what I want to show uh, about um, the interaction of complex analysis with probability theory is that one can regard complex analysis as an emergent phenomenon. It's something that emerges from the Z2 grid when you take a scaling limit. And finally, in the ever diminishing amount of time we have left, once this groundwork has been laid for what's in some sense the most important, but also the simplest case of a continuum limit, we'll be able to at least sketch the proof of uh, Schwernoff's theorem, which is that in a suitable sense, percolation, which is another random process, is also conformally invariant. Okay, so it will take us some time to make that precise, but we have all the language we need to make it precise. In particular, it will have everything to do with the modulus of a quadrilateral, which is something we understand very well now. Okay, so let me get started on random walks today. And um, before I do this, let me just ask for a show of hands. So this means press the... Um, press the raise hand button in the reactions uh, menu. So how many people have studied probability theory already? Use an actual hand so I get a, I get a tally. Okay, so at least half the class is willing to admit they've studied probability theory already. And I assume many people have, also, in some incidental way, um, I'm going to I'm going to go through some basic probability theory as we go towards random walks. I think even for people who have studied probability theory, the theory of random walks is surprisingly deep, and um, and at the same time, it's elementary in the sense that it uses often nothing beyond high school mathematics and maybe a little calculus. Uh, but there's some clever combinatorial arguments going on. But before we can get to those arguments, we need to have the language of probability theory available. So let me give a little background on uh, probability theory. It's interesting that probability was discussed for hundreds of years without anybody quite defining what it was they were talking about. And then Kolmogorov observed that measure theory can be used to make probability theory into a rigorous mathematical discussion. Before that, random variables, independent random variables, they were sort of intuitive things that everyone understood. Occasionally, Fermat and his collaborators would get into arguments about dice games because nobody had clearly decided what the foundation should be. So here's the foundations. So the formal setup, and we'll almost never allude to this, but we'll allude to results that follow from it, is we have some big space, and then we have a collection of subsets or events, and we have a measure, yeah. a mu. So omega is a, is a big set. This will be the set of all of the elementary events that can possibly happen in our discussion. A will be a sigma algebra of subsets of omega. And the elements of A are called events. 
that's a collection of things happening. The first, the coin came up heads the first five times. And then mu is a probability measure, which means it's a map from our events to the interval from zero to one. Of course, it has the property that the measure of the whole space is equal to one. That's what it means to be a probability measure. And it's, it's countably added. If you have disjoint events, um, the measure of their union is the sum of their measures. So in short, we just have a, a measure space, a set, a sigma algebra of measurable sets and, um, and a, a probability between zero and one, which is just the measure of each of these sets. Um, so the part of the, the uh, probability theory is just learning the language. So, so an event, as I just said, is an A in the sigma algebra, P of A, which is called the probability of A, is of course just the measure of this set. And now comes the first place it's easy to get confused, a random variable. What is formally a random variable? So it's simply a measurable function from the underlying space where we're doing measure theory to say the real or complex numbers. But this should be measurable. That is the pre-image of a open set should be a measurable set. Um, and then there's something called the expectation of X, which is the average value or your best guess for the value that X is going to take on. After all, you don't know what it is. The idea of this is that you pick points in omega at random and then see what the value of, is of X at those points. Those are samples of the random variable. And if you take a large number of samples, hopefully they average out to the expectation. So the expectation is nothing more than the integral over omega of x omega with respect to this measure of view. Of course, this expectation might be infinite. So this is only defined if the integral of the absolute value of x is finite. And for Positive, positive functions, that's an unambiguous notion. So if, if, if X is not in L1 of the space, then uh, it doesn't have an expectation. So I should say that this is defined for X in L1 of omega. Now, um, it's interesting to talk about the events that are determined by X. So if I have a random variable, I could take the event X is bigger than two. I could take the event X is a rational number. I could take the event that X is an integer. So in general, the, event, the events that you can cook up by interrogating this variable form a sub sigma algebra of A. So A of X is the sigma algebra generated by the events of the form A, which is just the event that X is in the interval from A to B. Or if you like the event that X is between, is less than A and bigger than B. Now these intervals generate all of the Borel sets on the real numbers. So this is actually just the preimage of the Borel sets on the real numbers under X. And it's a subalgebra of A. So they're all the events you can make up by interrogating the value of X. Okay, so random variables and events are closely connected by this construction. And that brings us to, I think, what is the most important notion in all of probability theory. This is where probability, up to here, we're just doing plain measure theory. But there's a notion which is not usually part of, pro, of measure theory, which is the notion of independence. And 
And for two events, this is very simple. If A1 and A2 are events, we say they are independent if the probability that A1 and A2 happens is just the probability that A1 happens times the probability that A2 happens. Now, there's a more intuitive way of phrasing this, which is we can ask, what is the probability of A1 given A2? So somebody says, oh my God, there's been a case of COVID in South America. What is the probability that it's raining in Harvard Square? Well, these have nothing to do with each other. So independence means the probability of A1 given A2 is the same as the probability of A1. Knowing A2 doesn't give you any new information about A, it doesn't influence its outcome. But what is this anyway? What's the probability of A1 given A2? Well, provided A2 has positive probability itself, this is just the probability of A1 um, and A2 divided by the probability of A2. And what this means is you take your measure mu, you restrict it to a measure on A2, it might not be a probability measure anymore. So you divide by the total measure of A2, and then you use that new measure to get a measure of A1. And uh, that doesn't change the, uh, the probability of A1, that's the notion of independence. Now, once you have the notion of two events being independent, you have the notion of many of them being independent. So if you have A1 up to An, these are all said to be independent if uh, the probability of A1 given any event determined by A2 up to An is still just the probability of A1. Complete knowledge of what happens with all these events has no effect on the outcome for A1. And similarly, we say that two random, uh, two, uh, random variables, x1 and x2, are independent if, if whenever we take an event that's determined by one, well, with one, two, then A1 and A2 are independent. And similarly for sequences of random variables. So one way to think of independent variables is it's like your measure space is a product space. Maybe it's the unit interval times the unit interval. And the first random variable only depends on the first coordinate. And the second random variable only depends on the second coordinate. And th then they're obviously uncorrelated or independent of one another. And also you can see what the integral should be of their product, because you can integrate over the first variable and the second variable independently. So in fact, when you have independent random variables, the expectation of the product of the two variables is just the expectation of the first times the expectation of the second. And that's just a mild generalization of, uh, of this statement here. This is the same statement where the variables are the indicator functions of the events A1 and A2. Okay. So, um, a little bit more standard terminology and then something interesting. So the mean of a random variable X is its expectation. Let's call that M. The variance of X measures how spread out it is around its mean. So this is the expectation of x minus m squared. Now, if x had units of length, then x minus m squared would have units of area. So it would be at a different units than x. So it's nice to have something that's the same units as x. So if this is the variation of x, 
then the standard deviation, usually denoted sigma of x, is the square root of the variance of x, of course, taken to be non negative. And now it's easy to see that independent, you see, variance is sort of saying the variable x is in L2. If it weren't in L2, you couldn't integrate it squared. So for the variance to even be defined, x has to be in L2 of omega. And once you're in L2 of omega, then you start to realize that maybe you should think of the expected value of the product as something like the inner product between x1 and x2. And now you see that if their mean is zero, then independent variables are orthogonal. So independence plus mean zero is basically saying that these are orthogonal vectors in L2 of our uh, measure space. And now what's the L2 norm of the sum of two orthogonal vectors, well, it obeys the Pythagorean the rule. So if x1 and x2 are independent, the variance of x1 plus x2 is just the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2. This is really should be thought of as the norm squared. And, and of course, the standard deviation then obeys the Pythagorean rule. It's the square root of the sum of x1 squared plus standard deviation of x2 squared. Okay. So now we come to the first general theorem in probability theorem. Um, this is called, these are called the Morel Cantelli lines. And they're usually called easy Borel Cantelli and hard Borel Cantelli, even though they're both pretty easy. <laughs> so they concern an infinite sequence of events. So I have a collection of events. And I want to know if infinitely many of these events happen. So I'm flipping a coin till the end of the universe and beyond. And I want to know if it comes up heads infinitely often. Um, so there's the event, let me call it B, is the event that infinitely many AI occur. Now, let me give you some notation for this. This is called the limb soup of AI. Why is it called the limb soup? Well, suppose you look at the indicator function of the event AI at a particular point in your measure space. For the limb soup to be one, it means you have to see the value one for infinitely many values of I, which means exactly that AI occurs infinitely many times. On the other hand, if you only see one for finitely many values, then this is then this is zero. So this is this is is if you like the limb soup of the indicator functions is the indicator function of b. We can also write this as a to just to show it's in the sigma algebra in the following way. So for infinitely many ii to occur, that means that for every n, so you have to take the intersection over n. And then we take the union over i greater than or equal to n, these ai's occurs. So this is the event that some event after event n occurs. And if that's true for every n, then obviously infinitely many events have to occur. OK, so what does the borel cantelli lemma say? Well, there's two statements. So there's easy, who says that if the sum of the probabilities of the AIs is finite, then the probability of the limb soup of the AIs is zero. This is an easy way to test if a, an event doesn't occur infinitely often. And this, the reason it's easy is because this is obvious. 
you see if this if this quantity here, which is a, a prerequisite for being in the limb sue, since we're taking an intersection, the measure of this event is less than or equal to the sum from n to infinity of the probability of the AIs. And if this sum is finite, then as n gets bigger and bigger, it tends to zero. And so that implies this is equal to zero. Uh, now the so-called hard Relkin telling is that a converse holds. Now the converse doesn't always hold, but it holds if the AI are independent. And the sum of the probabilities is equal to infinity, then the probability that infinitely many of them happen is actually equal to one. So for independent events, you have a very simple test to see if infinitely many of them happen. You look at the sum of the probabilities. If it's finite, only finitely many happen. If it's infinite, then with probability one, infinitely many of them happen. Notice that you don't get any probabilities between zero and one. The answer is always zero, zero or one. Well, let me explain just the idea of the proof of two. Let's compute the probability that none of the AIs happen. The probability that no AI occurs is what? This is the product of the of one minus the probability that AI does occur. For I goes from one to infinity. And now it's well known that this is equal to zero if and only if the sum of the PAIs is equal to infinity. In fact, one way to think of this is the logarithm of one minus X when X is small is almost the same as minus x. So when this sum diverges, the sum of these logarithms is minus infinity. And so the probability is zero. So this shows that when, they, when these sums diverge, certainly at least one of the events occurs. But this is also true if we start at n. And so therefore, with probability one, some event after the nth event also occurs. And therefore, infinitely many events occur. Okay, now this dichotomy between um, stuff happening um, uh, with probability zero or one turns out to be a very general phenomenon. And this, the general phenomena is called Kolmogorov's zero one law. So now let me do another little survey. How many people, you can just raise your hand in your video, especially if your video is on. How many people have heard of Kolmogorov's zero one law? Okay, good. So uh, let's see, Manon, do you wanna give us an idea of what it says? It says that uh, if you have independent random variables then you have a event depending only on the tail then it has probability either zero or one. Like yeah. yeah, exactly. So, it, so we, have, we have a collection of random variables, x1, x2, et cetera, that are independent. And then we have the notion of a tail event. Now, what is a tail event? So it's an event, it has to belong to our sigma algebra A. Now, it's, it should depend on these variables x1 up to xn. So it's actually in the sigma al algebra generated by all of these events. But in fact, it's in the sigma algebra generated by the events xn, xn plus one, et cetera. And it's in the intersection over n of this. So it's an event or an observation whose value is unchanged by changing finitely many of the values of these random variables. Let's look at an example. Here we have a collection of events. We can think of their indicator functions as random variables. What about the probability that infinitely many of them occur? 
Well, if we change what happens for the first thousand events, it doesn't change whether or not infinitely many of them occur. So in fact, look at the, the description of this event. This guy here is in the sigma algebra generated by AN, AN plus one, et cetera. It doesn't even depend on uh, AI for I less than N. And then we're taking the intersection of these. So we get something that's in the intersection of all of these uh, sigma algebras. So this is what's called a tail event. It's an event, an uh, observation or a measurement that only has to do with the asymptotic behavior of the sequence. So for example, of a tail event is uh, that XI convergence as I goes to infinity. Or the, 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 the limb soup of XI is equal to zero. A non-example would be that the maximum of XI is less than or equal to one. That doesn't work because it might be violated by the first few uh, XIs and then not by, it, not by the rest. So we have, really have to know all the XIs to compute the max, but we only need to know the tail of the sequence to compute the limb soup. And they call Magorov's zero one law is the theorem that uh, if A is a tail event, then the probability of A is zero and one. Okay, now here's a cultural question. Where else in mathematics do you have some sort of theorems and hypotheses and so on? And then at the end of the theorem, the conclusion is the measure of A is zero or one. Er ergodic theory. Ergodic theory. Who said that? Catherine? Yeah. So, so what's a statement in ergodic theory? Um, if you have some, if you have uh, an ergodic dynamical system, then if you have any two sets that separate it, then if you run it, if they're both, if both set, if you have two sets that cover the whole thing, then it's ergodic if and only if one of them has, and they're invariant, and it's ergodic if and only if one of them has full measure and one of them is zero measure. Okay, great. We, we can even say it for one set. If you have an invariant set, it either has measure zero or one. Yeah, great. So this, this uh, statement is a kind of ergodicity. And you might contemplate trying to somehow turn this whole discussion into some sort of theorem about a shift space with a measure space associated to HI and a big product, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out that this theorem is actually much easier than the ergodic theorem. And it it's because of independence. Independence is a very strong statement. Uh, in ergodic theory, Usually the position of a particle at time n is not independent of its position at time n plus one. There, those events are correlated because your map is deterministic. Whereas here we have this randomness. So let me just say what the proof is. This uses a little measure theory that I'm not gonna justify, but this uh, justification is well known. So remember that, um, your event A is in certainly in the sigma algebra generated by all of the events x1, x2, x3, et cetera. So the proof is that any A that depends on the variables x1 and et cetera, all of these infinitely many variables can be approximated. by events A n which only depend on the variables x1 up to xn. And um, if I approximate it, I mean the probability of the symmetric difference between a and an uh, uh, goes to zero. So in other words, the measure, here's the picture of the symmetric difference, here's a, here's an, the symmetric difference is this stuff. 
is the absolute value of the difference of their indicator functions. So the, the places where they don't coincide have measured going to zero. This is a basic fact in measure theory. It should remind you of something about Lebesgue measure on the real line, which is essentially the same the same uh, result. So if you look at Lebesgue measure on zero one, if you take a measurable set B in zero one and an epsilon greater than zero, then there exists a finite collection of intervals. I one up to I n such that the Lebesgue measure of the symmetric difference between E and this finite collection of intervals is less than epsilon. Now, why do I say that that's like saying it only depends on the first n random variables? Well, you can think of a point in zero one as corresponding to an X, which is given by a binary expansion. And then the digits of the binary expansion are in fact independent random variables. The probability of the first digit is one is a half. The probability of the 12th digit is zero is also a half. And those events don't influence one another because you can specify those digits independently. Now, if I adjust these intervals so that they only, their endpoints only depend on the first n digits in base two, which I can always do by changing their measure very slightly, then they are functions only of the first n digits, period. Membership in these intervals only depends on knowing the first n digits, which is tantamount to saying it lies in this sigma algebra. Okay, so that's the idea of the measure theory behind this step. It should be familiar from real analysis. And then we have the following great idea. But A and AN are independent. Because remember, A is also can be determined using only events with index bigger than n. And if you if, if you only use it indices bigger than n to define A, then of course it's independent of stuff using indices less than n. So the probability of A intersect AN is equal to the probability of A times the probability of AN. And of course, a n is looking more and more like a, so this tends to the probability of a squared. But of course, a n is looking more and more like a, so this converges to the probability of a. So a, the probability of a is equal to the probability of a squared, so the probability is zero or one. Okay, so the, one of the reasons I bring this up is that, of course, in Burrell Cantelli, the limb soup of a i is a tail event. And so we shouldn't be surprised that when the AI are independent, this probability is either zero or one. Okay, so now let's start to do some real math, i.e. calculus. So we're going to be considering Random walks on, uh, on on the integer lats, and often we'll be interested in a random variable which takes values in the integer lattice, like the location of our random walk after n steps, and that probability can be described as a function mapping the integer lattice to the real numbers, in fact, to the interval from zero to one. So we will be considering random walks on c to the d, d is the dimension of interest, and we're going to exploit the fact that g is an abelian group. In fact, it's a discrete, locally compact abelian group. And as such, it has a dual group. G hat, which is the homomorphisms from G into the circle. 
and or the characters of G. So an element here is given by chi of X is, well, it depends on a number theta, which lies in the circle to the D power. So in fact, G hat is equal to the set of D angular variables. So we'll think of the circle as being R mod two pi Z. And a number theta is theta one of the theta D. It's just a collection of angles. And a point X in ZD will be just um, given by a bunch of integers, X one up to X D. These are each and Z. Um, and then X theta will mean really X dot theta, which means the sum of X I theta. And notice that since these are integers, you can think of this as just adding theta I to itself X I times in this group. Or to put it differently, this is if X, if you know theta I mod two pi, then you know X I times theta I mod two pi. So that's product is well defined and it's an element of the of the circle of, of um, yeah an element of the circle and the character sorry the character determined by theta in g hat when applied to x is just e i x theta so that certainly is a homomorphism from z to the d to the circle and every homomorphism is of that type because all you have to do is say, what are the values of uh, this homomorphism, this character on the generators, the standard basis for Z to the D. And those values are theta one up to theta D. And, uh, and then this is the general value. So here I'm writing this as if the circle is, uh, is, is uh, also, the uh, complex numbers of absolute value one. Okay, so the reason I'm writing it that way is because um, in general, we have a Fourier transform available here, which gives an isomorphism between L2 of G and L2 of G hat. And I should mention that if you take G hat hat, you'll get back to G again. So this is a completely symmetric relation between these two functions. Now, before we can talk about L2, we have to know what the measures are. So for ZD, we have a measure, which is just counting measure. So the measure is equal to counting measure on ZD. So ZD as as a it's a group and its total Haar measure is infinite. Now on the circle, on the other hand, this is a compact group, so it has a um, it has a canonical invariant measure of total mass one, and that measure is d theta over uh, two pi to the d, where of course d theta means d theta one. Up to d theta d divided by the storm wise vector. Okay, so how does the Fourier transform work? Well, we start with a function f mapping the integers into C, say, and then its Fourier transform uh, is something we can evaluate at theta, and it's just given by um, the sum over all points zd of um, the value of uh, f of x times e to the minus i theta x. It's trying to determine the extent to which this character describes the function f of x. Now we'll almost always be interested in cases where f has finite support. So there will be no issue of convergence here but you'll notice that if f is in L1, since this is bounded, then this sum also certainly makes sense. 
Uh, and then we might want to go back from F to from uh, from the Fourier transform back to the uh, original function F, go back from F hat to F, and that can be easily done. F of X is then the, the integral with respect to this normalized time measure of F hat of theta times the character e to the i and theta to the Okay, and the L2 norms of these two things turn out to be the same. Now, why should we care? <laughs> what is the purpose of the Fourier transform? Well, suppose we have a random variable that doesn't take values in the real line or the complex numbers, but which takes random variables and that takes values in, uh, in Z to the D. So C maps X and maps omega into Z to the D. How should I describe the distribution of this random variable? Well, for each site in uh, Z to the D, I can ask what's the probability that this random variable assumes that value in the integer lattice? So I can define P of X to be equal to the probability that C is equal to X for each X in Z. And so I have my, my lattice, and then I have some weights on it, which are telling me where this random variable is distributed in the lattice. And now there's a very useful quantity I can form, Fc of theta. And this is, according to probabilists, the following beautiful thing. You take the expected value of e to the i theta times c. Isn't that great? So you have a random variable, you throw it in with a theta into the exponent of e to the i, and you see what the, what, the, what the expected value is of this new random variable. Now this random variable is bounded because this is e to the i something, so it certainly has an expectation. And you can vary the value of theta, you'll get a lot of different sort of moments of your random variable. In fact, you'll get enough to recover the random variable itself. And the reason you'll get enough to recover the random variable is that this is nothing more than the Fourier transform p hat. Except, and this is the convention in probability theory, we've put a plus i theta here, whereas we put a minus i theta here. So this is actually p hat of minus theta. Okay, now why is it so useful to apply the Fourier transform to understand random variables? It's very simple. Oh, and by the way, let me point out that this function P, since the total probability of uh, C is equal to one, we have that the sum of P of X is equal to one. In other words, P is in L1 of G, and this implies that p hat is a continuous function on the torus. It's just a convergent sum of, of, uh, of characters. So there's no, there's no trickiness about uh, the analysis when we're studying the distribution of random variables. Um, but here's the key point. I'll call this a theorem, but it's almost obvious. The, if you take C1 and C2 are independent random variables with values in Z to the B, then the Fourier transform of C1 plus C2 evaluated at theta is nothing more than the Fourier transform of the first times the Fourier transform of the second. And this is obvious because this quantity is nothing more than the expected value of E to the I theta C1 plus C2. And that's the product 
of the independent random variables e to the i theta c1 and e to the i theta c2. And my independence, that's the expected value of the product, which is exactly what this quantity is. Okay, so Fourier transforms allow us, they give us a sort of shortcut towards finding the distribution of a sum of independent random variables. We'll be especially interested in the case where all the random variables have the same distribution, then all these Fourier transforms will be the same, and we'll just be get taking the nth power of a fixed number. Okay, now let me bring this down to earth a little bit, because there's a more naive way of thinking about random variables, uh, Fourier transforms rather, that's very nice. And uh, this is the notion of generating functions. Um, so let's suppose we're in the really simple case where C is a random variable taking values in the integers. So equivalently, we just have a function P of n defined for n in the integers. And the sum of the p of n's is equal to one, and the p of n's are always positive. So how can we record the, this distribution of numbers on the integers? Well, one point is that if you have a bunch of numbers indexed by the integers, you can turn this into a polynomial by taking these to be the coefficients. Now, there might be infinitely many non-zero PNs, or there might not. Frequently, there will only be finitely many. Either way, we can at least formally form the sum from n goes from minus infinity to infinity of P of n times Z to the n. And let me call this Fc of Z. And now you might be alarmed. You might say, wait a second. We already have it, the notion, a notation for Fc. It's supposed to be the Fourier transform. But in fact, this is exactly the expected value of Z to the C. Because Pn is the probability that C takes on the value n. And if we set C equal to e to the i theta, then that's exactly the definition of the Fourier transform of C. So this is nothing more than the one dimensional case of the Fourier transform with this change of variables, Z equals e to the i theta. But now it's much simpler. So, so, so for example, if C is equal to plus or minus one, with equal probability, then this function of z is very simple. It's one half z plus the inverse. So it's we attach weights, the, the, the exponents record the possible values of c, and then the coefficients in front record the probability that that particular value is assumed. This theorem continues to hold since we've just made a change of variables. So if you have C1 and C2 are independent, then the generating function of their sum is just the product of their generating functions. But this is pretty easy to see now because you see when you take the product of uh, the sum of P1 of n, c to the n, or let's call it P1 of i, c to the i, and the sum of P2 of j, c to the j, what is the coefficient of z to the n? You get the sum over i plus j is equal to n of pi, pj, all times c to the n, and then you sum over n. And you see what you do is you look at the different ways in which the sum c1 plus c2 
could equal n. It could happen that it, th these different ways that it could happen when C1 is I and when C2 is J for every possible way of breaking n up as a sum. And the probability of each of those events by independence is just the product of their individual probabilities. So that explains why these generating functions work. Um, okay, so that's a, in, in the one dimensional case, a kind of simpler and more naive way of approaching this study. Now, just to make a long story short, next time, we are going to study the probability that a random walk on the integers or on c to the d returns to the origin after n steps. Now the random walk is going to be described as a sum of independent random variables. And so we're going to be able to use the Fourier transform to write that probability as something to relate it to a high power of a single function. And it turns out that function in the one dimensional case is going to be just cosine. So here's a question to contemplate for next time. This is a famous question I saw on Arnold's problem list of problems that every math PhD should be able to easily solve. Um, the question I want to pose is, what is the average value of, I'll say cosine, cosine x to the 100th power. And the constraints are no calculators, let alone computers, and, um, and try to find it in less than or equal to 10 minutes. But within, say, 30%. I don't ask that you come up with an exact number. Now, of course, you might say, well, let me think about what the function cosine looks like. So it goes like this. When you raise it to a very high power, here it is one. When you raise it to a very high power, it's, it's zero most places. But it's very peak near one. So, so, um, you might say, well, it's zero. <laughs> the average value is zero because it's away from a small neighborhood of one, it's zero, but it's bounded by one. But of course, that's not what I want to know. It is not that big, but it's also not that small. And so when I say within 30%, I mean within a multiplicative factor of 30%. Is it, is it more like 10 to the minus 10 or is it more like a half? give an estimate that's uh, at least in the right ballpark. Okay, and we'll return to that next time and that will kind of unfold the relationship between the Fourier transform, Gaussian distributions and random walks on the integers and on Z to the D. Okay, so please look at the course notes on random walks and also at the book, Dinkin and Yuskovich, which I think is very uh, fun to read. I, I really recommend it.